Verse 18 is where we're picking it up. Paul says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. May God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and He will do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let's pray. Father, as we finish up 1 Thessalonians uh, today, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. We thank you for giving us your word. We thank you for allowing us to go through it chapter by chapter, verse by verse, to see what you have for us uh, in the word of God. And and we just really pray that you would speak uh, to individual hearts today because you know where everyone is. In their lives. You know spiritually where they are in their growth. You know what's going on specifically in their lives. You know uh, what's happening in their families and businesses and, and, uh, and in their minds. And, and so, Lord, it's, it's with great confidence that we pray and commit this time to you because we believe that you are able and, and, and willing to speak to your people today. And we ask that you would do it in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. Paul begins this section, verse 18, or at least the section that we're going to be looking at here today, by saying, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You'll you'll notice he doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances, uh, because frankly there are a great many circumstances that we endure in life that are very, very difficult, very, very painful, and um, and, and very hard. And, and for us to actually thank God for that... Um, I don't know, you might get to a place in your life where down the road you can do that. You know, you can say, God, thank you for taking me through the ringer uh, and getting me on the other side of it because I see your hand, I see your grace, I see your work. And, and, And frankly, though, whether you can come to that place or not, we can still give thanks in all circumstances because of the fact that God is in our lives through everything. And that's the point. (laughs) That's the reason that we can give thanks in all circumstances, because God is in our lives. God is working in our lives. God is, is, is not only there, but He is using all of those things. You know, some of you might be asking here this morning, you know, why should I give thanks for, for a, a painful difficult situation that I'm going through in my life, it's hurtful or scary or, or whatever. You know, what's good about those? Paul isn't as much exhorting us to give thanks about the circumstances or it's not, it isn't about what you're going through. It's about the fact that God is in the midst of your circumstances and even regardless of what you're going through today, as rotten as it might be, there's, there's something that you can give thanks for, that God has not left you, that God has not abandoned you in any way, even though you may feel that way. And, and let me just say, <laughs> I understand feelings. I've got them myself, but you can't live by them. And you definitely cannot create a theology based on them. Or your theology is going to be doing one of those numbers. And, and you know, that's basically what Job did, eventually. As, you know, he went through a, a terrible time of pain and struggle and difficulty, and it changed his view of God. He began to see God as unfair. Now, his friends thought that all this stuff was happening to Job because he just obviously messed up somewhere along the line. So Job just, you know, repent, and, and maybe God will have mercy on you. And Job was going, they didn't do anything wrong. And he was right. He didn't. He was a righteous man. But as he went through, as you read through the book of Job, the pain eventually tweaked his theology. And and it, and it, and it, it changed who God was in his mind. It changed literally the person of God to the point where uh, he started to say some pretty bold and dumb things like, 
you know, if God would just come and meet with me here, I'd have a few things I'd like to say to him. And that's not a smart thing to say because he got his wish. And you remember the book of Job. But, uh, you know, God appeared and questioned Job a, a, a little bit. And Job realized he had spoken foolishly and that he had allowed the circumstances of his life to alter his view of God. There's a lot of people that have done that. And Job is by no means an isolated instance. But when we, when, we, when we go through difficult circumstances and then we allow our feelings, how I feel about what I'm going through, to shape what's happening, eventually it's going to make its way down to what, how I feel about God and how I even view Him. And that's dangerous, Christians. Here's the deal. You can be going through the worst of circumstances, the most difficult, the most painful, the, the scariest of circumstances, and God is not changing one iota. God is still good. He still loves you with an intense longing for greater intimacy than you could possibly hope to want to have with Him. And, 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 and nothing, nothing has changed and He is right there and He is standing with you and He is holding you and guiding you and directing you. And not only that, but He has made a promise that even in the worst of circumstances, that as you commit them to Him, He will bring them in your life, use them in your life for good. I know that most of you know Romans 8.28, so we won't take time to turn there. But if you don't, if you're not really aware of it, make a little mental or, or physical note somewhere because Romans 8.28 says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And sometimes we have to go back to that Scripture, don't we, and see if it still says all things. Because sometimes we'll be going through something and we'll think, there's just no way God can use this. Let me tell you something. In the hands of God, nothing is impossible. And God can use whatever you're going through. You know, there's another wonderful passage that... that and, I, and I do want to take time to do this because it's so important. Go to Hebrews 12. I, I want to show you a, an important passage there. Um, Hebrews chapter 12. And then once you get to the 12th chapter, uh, skip down with me to verse 7. And, and I want to just, I want to speak to those of you specifically who right now are going through a real difficult hardship. And I also want to speak to those of you who aren't, because if you're not in a hardship right now, you will. <laughs> Somebody once said, and I think it's true, we're either coming out of a difficulty, we're either in one or we're going into one. And, and so it's, it's like, you know, and if you've got a momentary breathing place, then praise the Lord. But um, we go through difficulties, don't we, all the time. How are we to even look at them? How are we to view them? Look at verse 7. The writer of Hebrews says, endure hardship as discipline. So the very first thing he says here is that you and I are to literally go through the hardships of life as if it were discipline, okay? As if the Lord were using it to train you. And don't think of discipline, people. Be careful here. Don't think of discipline just as a swat. You, we've, 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 we've messed up the word discipline. Listen, the word discipline is where we get our word disciple. And it speaks of a follower who is in training. Okay? So discipline is training. Okay, so Paul is saying endure hardship as training. You're being trained to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. Notice he says here, he goes on in this verse and says, God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined or trained by his father? And if you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children, he says, and not true sons. Moreover, We've all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits, he says, and live? And look what he goes on to say. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. And some of them, by the way, weren't very good. And we, and we grow up and we recognize it. In some cases, our fathers were not very good disciplinarians. In fact, some of them were downright lousy. But they probably thought they were doing 
what they thought was the best, you know. But look what he says here. He says, but God trains or disciplines us for our good. Why? That we may share in his holiness. Okay? That's, that's the end result. But there's an important verse that has to come with this passage, and that's verse 11. It says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. And you can't leave out those last words. For those who have been trained by it. Those are such important words. They, They probably should be underlined in your Bible if they're not. Because it doesn't say that the training of discipline is automatic. It says it is, it comes to those who have allowed themselves to be trained by it. Okay? Now, who are those who have allowed themselves to be trained by it? Frankly, those who see hardship as discipline. That's, that's it. It's, it's, that's the key. If I, if I see what I'm going through and think about it as, okay, God is training me. And you say, well, training me for what? Oh, I don't know. Pick one. Whatever, you know, the Lord has been speaking to you about lately. I don't know. Whatever it may be. Whatever God's been, you got on the front burner of your life, you know. So he's training you. Patience. Faith. Trust. Hope. You know. Committing things to the Lord. Surrender. Whatever. Whatever, whatever, whatever. That's what God's doing. And when you and I do that, When we say, okay, this hardship, this problem, this issue is a training. I am in school and I am being trained by the Lord. You know, it gives, first of all, it gives you a whole other perspective. Think about the people in the world that are going through hardships and difficulties. Sure, they talk about character building and character development, but what for? For this life? Well, then this life is over and then what? Oh, great. I invested myself in a lifelong, you know, chance to uh, improve myself. For why? For what? For what reason? So I could take it to my grave and put something nice on my headstone that says, He was, he had great character. Yippee. You and I are being trained for way more than this life. We're, We're being trained for this life and the next that we might share in His holiness, that we might take these things on into eternity, that our life in Christ might be full now and later. Don't think that the things you're going through right now are just for right now. God has an eternal perspective as it relates to your life and my life and an eternal plan. And that is one of the most comforting things that I know. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. As Paul goes on here, he says in verse 19, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Or literally, quite literally, do not quench the Spirit. Now, in fact, that's what your Bible may say. And the word quench or put out, as it's used here in the NIV, applies to what you might do by uh, putting out uh, uh, your, your campfire or a flame or something like that. And it's one of, the, frankly, one of the images of the Holy Spirit in the Scripture is that of fire. And so here, by saying the Spirit's fire, Paul is applying the phrase metaphorically to referring to not putting out the fire of the Holy Spirit among us. Okay? So, and you know, it's a great... <laughs> Exhortation. Don't, don't put out the Spirit's fire. Okay? Okay. There's only one problem with this. Everybody seems to have their own idea of what the moving or the fire of the Spirit looks like. And usually it's whatever we've been trained that it looks like. You know what I mean? And, and, and typically it's kind of like whatever church we went to in the past... 
And the way we saw it done there, that's the moving of the Spirit. Why? Because that's what people told us. We would get done having a particular church service that contained certain things or phenomena. And then we would say, and somebody would walk up to us after the service and they'd say, Oh man, Spirit was really moving today. And so we go, Oh, that's what the moving of the Spirit is. So then you go to another church and you sit down and you're, and you're there and they don't do those things. And so what do the what do people do? They go, well, the Spirit's not moving in that church. And the reason is because they're defining it by a narrow definition of what they've experienced in the past and what they were told was the moving of the Spirit. And it particularly happens in more Pentecostal churches. People kind of get trained, if you will, as to what... The, the, the moving of the Spirit is, and, and so forth. And, they'll, and if they don't see that exact form, then everybody else is quenching the Spirit. Now, that's a toughie. But Paul is actually going to cite one kind of quenching the Spirit that can happen in the church in the very next verse, verse 20. Jim, I'm going to have you turn that fan on constant, would you please? Uh, verse 20, look at this. It says, Do not treat prophecies with contempt, all right? And that is certainly one of the ways that we can put out the Spirit's fire or one of the ways that we can quench the moving uh, of the Spirit. Now, a prophecy is basically a message given from the Lord through one of His servants, okay? That's, that's, the, that's the broad, general term of prophecy. But here's where a lot of misunderstanding in the body of Christ comes from. It is generally believed by a large group of Christians today that prophecy is primarily foretelling. Okay? In other words, if you say prophecy to someone and then say, define that for me, they will say, it's God foretelling the future. Well, prophecy contains that of foretelling, uh, and God does a lot of it in the Scripture. He, and there's a great deal of Scripture that is yet unfulfilled. So it is, uh, there's a lot of foretelling in the Scripture. But please understand, Christians, prophecy is also forthtelling. So in other words, it can simply be a declaration or a statement made by God that has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the future. But it's simply a statement from the Lord or a statement that the Lord moves one of his servants to simply say. And I believe this confusion as to what prophecy is, is behind a lot of the misunderstanding in the body of Christ today. I've talked to uh, Christians throughout the years who will tell me that they no longer believe that prophecy is going on in the body of Christ today. And I'll ask them why for what reason do you not believe prophecy is active? And they will say, well, because I no longer believe that God is telling us about future events. Okay? That's number one. Because I, they'll say, I believe everything He wants to tell us about the future is given us in the Word of God. And they will secondarily say, I don't believe God is adding any revelation to what has already been given to us in the Scripture. And I come back and I say, I believe in prophecy today, but I also believe the same things you just said. I don't believe God is adding to the revelation of future or, or the revelation of Scripture. I don't believe that. I believe that what we have in the Word of God is what God is going to give us as it relates to telling us about the future and as it relates to giving us insights into understanding the things of God as far as doctrine, the, 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 the declarations of truth that He's going to make to us. I believe all of those things. But does that mean God no longer has anything to say? Does that mean He's done talking? Does that mean He doesn't have anything to say to you? It could have nothing to do with uh, the, 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 the expansion of revelation or nothing to do with, with speaking to you about the future. But can't he even say, I love you? Can't he come uh, through someone who has a prophetic gifting and speak to you and exhort you to say, trust in me? Put your hope in me? There's something in your life you need to change? There's something in your life that you need to let go of or whatever the case might be. I think God has lots of things He still wants to say to His church. 
You know, it's interesting. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 14, don't turn there, but he said to them that everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Okay? That's 1 Corinthians 14.3. Did you hear that? Prophecy is for people's strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Now, you don't think God wants to strengthen His children anymore? How about encourage them? How about comfort them? Oh, I think He's got lots to say still to His children. And I am so thankful that God still moves upon the hearts of His servants from time to time. And once in a while, maybe you've been here at Calvary Chapel, you've been somewhere else, where somebody maybe on the worship team or something just said, you know, I have a sense from the Lord that He wants to say to you, or maybe to just a select few of you, I am here. I love you. Don't let go. Or or something specific. Maybe the Lord will even lay out in a prophetic sense something that the person who is speaking it couldn't have had any way of knowing except that the Lord laid it upon their heart. And that is a word of prophecy. And there's nothing weird about it. And there's nothing unbiblical about it. You know, what's interesting, see, here here at at Calvary Chapel, we believe that all of the Word of God, and and particularly the things that are spoken to the the New Testament church, are just as applicable today as they were then. We We don't relegate certain aspects of Scripture to a different dispensation. In other words, we don't say, well, that was for the apostolic era. And after the apostles all died out, well, then we didn't need those things anymore. Well, I have a problem with that interpretation. Because first of all, there's nothing in the Scripture that even begins to support that conclusion that there was going to be an apostolic era that died out and then certain gifts of the Spirit would die out with it. And the other thing, too, is that if you hold to that strict sort of a dispensational kind of a viewpoint, then there are great, there are huge chunks of the New Testament that no longer apply to you or to your belief structure. They're like, you just have to kind of like say, well, that was then. But we're not doing that anymore, so let's just skip on to the next verse. Well, we don't believe that. We believe it's for today. as much. We believe it's for the church age. You know, as we've been talking here about quenching the Holy Spirit, there's a lot of ways that you can quench the Holy Spirit. Paul started off by just giving us one example, and that is don't treat prophecies with contempt. But there are lots of other ways that we can just as easily quench the moving of the Holy Spirit among us. Some have to do with how we treat one another. Some have to do with the things we say to and about one another. Some have to do with how you treat people when they come to church for the first time. They're brand new and they're standing there kind of looking, you know, they got that deer in the headlight kind of a look. And, and, And you walk right by them. And don't reach out a hand or greet them and make them feel welcome and extend to them the warmth of fellowship and so forth. That can grieve the Holy Spirit too. There's a lot of things that can grieve the Holy Spirit. I think too that anything that draws attention to a person and doesn't give attention to Jesus Christ, I believe that grieves the Holy Spirit because one one of the most wonderful functions of the Holy Spirit is to exalt Jesus Christ. I believe He delights to do that. When the the Holy Spirit is among us, He delights to just exalt Jesus and wherever believers are together. But if you got a believer, you know, up on stage or you know doing kind of a performance thing, or you got you know everybody's you know sitting during worship and and there's one person standing and kind of you know doing one of those numbers, that I think that can grieve the Holy Spirit too, because what we're doing is we're drawing attention to me instead of Him. And, 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 you know, you ask yourself, what, what's, what's appropriate for worship? What's appropriate? When we come together and worship, what's appropriate? Anything that doesn't call attention to you. <laughs> That's pretty simple. Because I think it grieves the Holy Spirit. You know? We're here to focus on Him. We're here to direct everybody's attention that way. Not this way. So, I think there's a lot of things that can quench or grieve the Spirit of God among us. Verse 21, test everything. Hold on to the good. And I I think it's interesting that Paul made this remark right after making the remark about not despising prophecy. Isn't it interesting that those came back to back? He says, test everything. Well, obviously the test for anyone claiming to speak by the Holy Spirit is the Word of God. 
And everything ought to be measured according to that standard. You know, it's what's interesting here is we're reading this letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. But do you know that right after Paul left Thessalonica, do you know where he went? He went to Berea. And when he got to Berea, it says that he started, he started speaking the word of God to the Bereans. And those people did something that other people didn't do. They checked the word of God to see if Paul was really speaking the truth or if he was out to lunch. And so they, they heard him and they didn't just go, oh, I don't believe that. Why? Well, I just don't feel good about it or I don't have a, the right burning in my bosom or something like that. They, they just said, they said, well, you know what? We're going to check that out. They got into the word and they said, all right, you know, and they and they read and they checked and they, you know what? He's right. It says that the Bereans were of more noble character. They tested it. Paul says that we're to test everything. And you notice that Paul and and, and Paul was delighted with the Bereans. You know, you you can always tell somebody that doesn't have a, a good character because they don't ever want their word to be tested. And when you say to them, well, I'm going to check that out and see if it's true. They get all offended. Paul, I don't think Paul was ever the least bit offended. When those Bereans said, well, you know what? We're going to check it out and see if you're, if you're saying what's right. He probably went, oh, praise God. <laughs> because he knew he was speaking the truth and he knew that the word of God corroborated everything that he had to say. Praise the Lord, they're going to check it out. That's a man of character. And, and, and we need to be people who are checking things out. And you know what, though? It's amazing to me that there is such a huge sector of the Christian church that ignores this command. We'll see it in the Word of God. Test everything. Test everything. Test everything. Hold on to the good. And you know what we do? We go, hey, that's a good word. Then we go off and we do just the opposite. Let me give you an example. There is a phenomena, and we've talked about this before, but there's a phenomena within the body of Christ, some sectors of the body of Christ, that is known as being slain in the Spirit. And people will come up to the front usually, and when the pastor or leader, whoever's praying for them, touches their forehead, they, they fall backward into the, the, the waiting arms, hopefully anyway, uh, of, of a catcher, and the catcher then gently lowers them to the floor where the Lord proceeds to minister to their hearts while they're lying on the floor. Well, you know, sounds good. Sounds fine. There's only one problem. If you apply this test... To that phenomena, you're going to find that the, that, that phenomena of being slain in the Spirit comes up with zero biblical backing. Now, am I saying that lying on the floor, God can't minister to people? No, I'm not saying that. Am I saying that when you, if you experienced that phenomena, or if you, you know, fell on the floor and you, you know, uh, God ministered, am I saying that that wasn't real? No. Because here's the deal. God ministers to the hungry heart. I've noticed that. I I wish sometimes he didn't. I wish sometimes God would say, you know what, that's not a biblical thing. So I'm not going to meet you there. But you know, it's interesting. He doesn't do that. He, when somebody comes to him by faith, I mean, the Bible says, knock and the door will be opened, right? And so even if you do something dopey, but your heart is sincere, God will meet you there. That's not, the, that's not the issue. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, what we do as Christians is, we will see something, experience something good from it, and then come up with a doctrinal position based on it. And you know what that is? That's doctrine by experience, not doctrine by revelation. And, and Christians, we have got to get to the point where we test everything and we decide whether or not that is biblical. And you might even be saying here, to yourself or thinking to yourself, Pastor Paul, aren't you being a little rigid here? I mean, what's the danger? What's the danger with that? Well, let me tell you what the danger is. The danger lies in the fact that if you are allowing yourself or giving yourself permission to believe something, like being slain in the Spirit, even though it isn't in the Word of God, and, and even though you have been told to apply that standard to things, and you still allow yourself to believe it, what you're doing is you're applying a standard of belief that supersedes the Word. And, and, and if you give yourself an inch, you're going to take a mile. And my question is, then where do you stop? Okay, once you start applying a standard that isn't biblical, 
Where do you stop? Now, see, I'll come back and I'll say to somebody who believes in being slain in the Spirit, I'll say, how do you know that that's a good thing? Or how do you know that that's a right thing or we, something we should be doing? And you know what they'll say every time? Because it happened to me and it was good. Well, you see what they've done? They've applied a standard of experience. Christians, we were never, ever told to test things by experience. Because experiences can lie and deceive you. But the Word of God will never do that. And so we're always to test by the Word. Okay? Don't give yourself the freedom to embrace something just because you had a good experience. Because you know what? Then you'll reject things because you had a bad experience. Even though that is biblical. You know? Somebody came up and laid hands on me when we were praying. I just got creeped out. I am never going to let anybody lay hands on me and pray for me ever again. Hey, I understand getting creeped out if somebody lays hands on you. That's biblical, at least. Hey, somebody could, they could say, you know, hey, you know, that's a biblical form of prayer. Now, if it creeps you out, great, we won't do it. But the point is, at least it's biblical. Verse 22. Avoid every kind of evil. Your Bible may say, avoid every form of evil. And basically that word, form or, or, or kind, as it's translated in the NIV, it means that which is seen. So basically it refers to external appearances. In other words, avoid what is commonly seen as evil. Verse 23, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Did you notice here that Paul gives credence to the fact that you and I are a trichotomy? Notice that he says, may uh, the Lord keep your whole spirit, soul, and body. Did you notice that? Now, for Christians, we're... You know, we're cool with that. But, you know, we live in a culture today that is consumed with the natural. And, and everything is physical or emotional. And the spirit is either ignored altogether or twisted. And, and yet, you and I are spiritual beings as much as we are physical beings, as much as we are emotional beings. And that's the soul, by the way, the emotions and the intellect. So... Why is it that we leave out the Spirit when we're thinking about our problems or diagnosing our problems or thinking how to deal with our problems? Paul says, may your whole spirit, body, and soul be kept. Because there's, there's you know, that, that's you. He ends this way. Verse 25, brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's where we're going to stop. I'm going to ask the men who are serving communion this morning to go ahead and ready themselves to serve. Go do that, guys, if you would, please. As the rest of us just take a moment here uh, to um, just kind of prepare our hearts and, uh, and ready our hearts to receive. Because communion is all about focusing back on the person of Jesus Christ and putting our focus on Him and on Him alone. Jesus Christ, the One who gave His life for us, who who had upon His body heaped all of the penalty of our sin, who shed His blood that we might be purchased from death to life. So, let's pray. Jesus, we love You. As we take time to, as we close out our our time here together this morning, Father God, we just we just pray. And we ask, Lord God, that your spirit would guide us as as we remember the beauty and the tenderness and the faithfulness of our God, saving us from our sin through the elements that we partake in. Be with us, Lord God, as we just take time to remember, to remember the wonders of Your love. Be with us, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Amen.